intervene. Okay, and we are now on uh, the Metro Spatial Plan. This is page 47 of the report. In the business cases, it is item 14.9, page five. Am I right? Have I got it right? At page 576. All right. Thanks, Jonah. Jonah. Thanks, Jonah. Jonah. Not in the Cote. So we we uh, the first uh, business case to discuss with you this morning is the Metro Spatial Plan. So um, maybe I'll pass to Sarah to just give a few words, and then we're happy to help with any discussion. Uh, okay. Hi everyone. Um, as many of you will be aware, this is the continuation of work that was started about three years ago to um, look at integrating um, public transport and land use in the Hamilton Waikato Metro Special Area. Um, this business case is the next step in that process, um, which is uh, looking at how we move from our current quite coveragey service to a much more ridership focused service, um, but also how we partner with our infrastructure councils, which would be Hamilton, Waipa and Waikato to deliver bus priority and other items such as park and ride facilities um, in the metro area. Any questions? And just um, just in terms of the area, you mentioned Hamilton City, Waipa and Waikato. Is there a reason Matamata Piako is not? Oh, sorry, there? you are quite correct. Matamata Piako are also part of Future Proof on this um, okay. MSP. <laughs> Just wasn't sure. I just wasn't sure. Oh, if I... you've been absolutely no, okay. correct. Sorry, okay. apologies. Cool. All right. Are there any questions on this business case? So this, and this is not prior year surplus, even though it's short term. Right? No. This is not funded right through prior year surplus. Just wanting to clarify that. We have um, we have funding in this financial year that is on surplus that will carry us through to the next LDP period. Great. OK, I've got Councillor Dunbar Smith and then Councillor Graff. And oh, simply to say it's nice to see something that's jointly funded with other partners. That's mm. All. Mm. Thanks for that, uh, Clyde. Oh, thanks. Um, just just looking at the target of um, reducing car travel by 862,000 kilometres per day by 2051. So who, who's the target um, user of the buses, et cetera, do you think, in the next 10 years? Who are you targeting? Is it the poor or the rich? Oh, it's and everyone. So here's the other. So is there currently security for bus drivers on the buses? Um. So we... um have security cameras on all of our buses. Um, we have um, worked with Hamilton City Council in areas like City Safe in the transport centre. Um, so, yeah, but the key to having safe buses is having lots of passengers on those buses as well. Um, so they yeah. been themselves, because I, I talk to people on buses uh, who use transport, public transport, and they're concerned about the level of violence and aggression on the buses now. Mm. And that's only going to get worse, given that everything's quite uh, divisive in the community. Um, so, yeah, I just wondered about that. Is, there, is, is, some, is security something that you're looking at um, I mean, that, in future in public transport? The, the... Because I don't see how we're going to get people out of vehicles. Um, so there's security is part of the equation with um, public transport and always will be. Um, but the focus of this work is very strategic. It's around getting the ridership network up and running. We have issues on buses where there are limited numbers of people. Um, the more people you have on a public transport place, the more people you have in the hubs, the less likely these things are to occur because there's more general oversight. Um, there are more people, there are more things. Yeah, so, yeah. so I'm not tackling security as part of this. This is a strategic piece sure. of work, but we'll be raising the standard of our PT no. services across the board, which yep. will have an impact on that type of issue. Yeah. 
Okay, so just just in, just in regards to security, this is not security is not part of this business case. No, but we can take on board. No, yeah. no, no, sorry, but and, no it's an opportunity and, and you to can um, reflect back. I'm sure to the council on other programs. Yeah, that the re the that reason I raised it is because there's a target to try to reduce vehicles on the road. How are you going to achieve that when people aren't? going to be wanting to use public transport because it's not safe. That's just an opportunity to ask that question. Yeah, and it's it's a valid question and it's something that we we work on every day. Um, it's going to be part of um, the next round of, of contracts are going to obviously have to think about bus design and and, uh, and and it's it's just something that we deal with every day, but it's a it's a very good point. Uh, um, Councillor Hodge. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where this question is going to go, but in public transport and you're looking at the outer places like the Waipa, blah, 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 and I'm presuming that it's from point A to point B. So point B will be where they get dispatched in Hamilton. And then, then I wonder about where does the public transport fit into the, moving those people around Hamilton? Um, on, on a regular basis, because what is happening, I believe, is that people do come into Hamilton, but they can't get to point B, C, D, E, because yes. there's no other way. So hence yeah. why they don't use public transport, because it's easier to use their car. So I, I wonder how this is all working out to make it feasible around a B, C, D. Yeah, um, it's a really good point. Um, and um, I think it's on page... Let me see. If you go to page 582, you'll see um, the two networks side by side. So on the left-hand side is the current Hamilton network, and there are feeder services that come into that network from Cambridge, TOMO2, um, and so on. Mm. Um, in the past, what we've tried to do is develop a sort of coverage network that gets everyone roughly where they might want to go, albeit very slowly. Um, if you look at the um, diagram to the right hand side, you'll see that there's um, some big sort of white dots on some of these big thick lines. Um, the purpose of those is that they're interchange points and each of those lines will be operating at a high frequency. So we take the coverage lines away and instead what we do is you'll come into Hamilton from the south and you might stop somewhere in Peacocks at an interchange, and that will allow you to go to the east um, or up to um, the north via the other side of the city. Um, and that interchange will have an average wait time of five minutes, and those routes will be on bus priority corridors. So it'll be faster. So in each of these steps, we're trying to optimise how many other connections you can get to by making each of those connections really efficient. Um, so it will be a different way of moving around, but the approach is to ensure that if you want to come from the south and your destination is not the base, but it might be Rotatuna, you can stop off at that little nub at the bottom there that you can see Mark Peacocks and you can go on the uh, orange line up through and get up to that side of the city on that route. Similarly, if you were coming from the east, you'd maybe stop at a node on the eastern side and that would give you options going in either direction. All of those lines that we're showing will be operating at a much higher level of frequency than we currently do. But to afford that, you have to pull out some of the coverage and make that coverage operate in a very different way. And on demand is where we're looking in terms of some of that coverage network. So. If any of you were at the RTC, we had a lady called Pam who came to speak to us about the fact that although the Meteor was a much more frequent service, she was struggling a bit to access that service. That's where our on-demand comes in, in this type of model. It helps those people get to those big lines. Um, and then where our partners come in and lift this game for us in terms of reducing our OPEX costs is they put the priority in, which makes it faster for us to get around. Hopefully that was useful. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right. I've got Councillor Strange, Smith, Nicole, and Mar. Uh, Councillor Strange, uh, I need to get her a red light though. Noel, can I get you to tag off? Tag on. Thank Nine. you. 
Yeah, thank you, um, Sarah, for your work on this and Phil. Um, yeah, this is a really important work with our partners. And um, yeah, the the money is um, supplemented by Waka Kutahi as well. So um, yeah, that co-investment that Ben mentioned before is really important. Um, you know, the integration of land use and transport um, means we are more resilient, which is what the SALTP is all about. So, um, yes, yeah, really supportive of um, where this is going as well. And, um, yeah, the meteor success that you did just talk about um, is, yeah, it is really such a good news story. Mm. And if only we could have more of those services throughout Hamilton, um, then more people could take the bus. And a lot of those criticisms of the more coverage services that they're Perception is that they're empty. Who knows what that's like over the whole route um, and at different times. But, um, yeah, the, that um, really goes against those criticisms about, you know, where we want to head. And, um, yeah, the targets as well, Clyde, um, and the safety. Yeah, I appreciate your points around um, safety of people mm. on the buses and the bus drivers as well. Um, and I know that's Stu... Um, and Phil as well are involved in nationwide conversations around bus safety um, and bus driver safety as well. So um, through our procurement of new vehicles, as Phil said, um, bus driver safety and passenger safety is paramount, um, as well as the use of cash um, through the fares review. Um, you know, that disincentivizing the use of cash reduces um, some um, Prime, I suppose you'd say. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we are always aware of it and um, trying to make different um, solutions for different problems as well. So, yeah, really supportive of this. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Over my time involved with councils, I've seen the Use of the buses increase in my uh, constituency, particularly Raglan and Huntley, and they're one of the um, higher uh, supported um, bus services in the region. It's, however, it's very difficult. Uh, and look, I accept they're necessary uh, because I used to think pensions weren't necessary or um, benefits and whatever, but there has to be a minimum standard of uh, living. So. Uh, benefits are necessary come to accept that and so there's a certain level of public transport that's necessary as well to support those who can't afford their own however it's very difficult to support ideology when you get stupid and they are stupid decisions to put bus stops in the middle of a lane particularly on Pembroke Street in Hamilton which is the main route into the hospital for ambulances and having been um, gone to the hospital a couple of three times to be in a row of traffic waiting for people and ambulances to come through and being blocked by two buses who are opposite each other at an absolute dead stop in traffic. This is one of the most stupid decisions I've ever seen by Hamilton City and it's supported by this council. I cannot believe I haven't experienced it personally. So I, I just can't support ideology to the extent, yeah, if it's practical, if it provides a level of support. But yeah, I, I'm torn as to whether I can support anything in public transport um, other than yeah, <laughs> the basic services. Yes, yeah, so I've said enough, but I just am frustrated with some of the decisions um, and whether that's seen as a criticism of staff. Uh, I apologise if, if you take it personally, but the reality is it's not practical. It, you, uh, you, you know, if you put traffic lights on, it's a negative BC. If you put a bus in the middle of a road, <laughs> it's got to be negative BC that you stop the movement of traffic dead. So anyway, I've said my bit, but I, uh, yeah, anyway, I'm frustrated. Noted. Um, just <laughs> got it. Uh, this just uh, so I'm clear, this is supported by uh, Future Proof members, correct? Yes. Yeah. So we've got. All right. Who, what do we got? Uh, Councillor Nickel. Thanks. Uh, 
Thank you both. Um, and thanks for pointing us to that picture on page 582, because that summarizes a lot of what where we are and where we want to go. The coverage network. First time I looked at it, I just thought, I don't want to take the bus. <laughs> it looks fucking complicated. <laughs> um, that system is designed for what we've got now, which is mm. like one person per bus. Um, it, because you're doing coverage, right? Like that's the natural outcome from that design for this city, proven by history. So we need to change that because we don't like one person, one bus. And we know from other 21st century cities around the world, when you jump on their service, you see a diagram like on the right. And that works. And there are lots of people on that bus with you. And I realize, you know, sometimes they're much bigger cities, but it works. Um, and it's just more efficient to have more people on one bus. So we're looking at going in that direction based on the research and the evidence and the logical next step for the city. Um, and I like how this business case actually doesn't have any options, just saying. Uh, this is the logical next best step, step for the city. And just to address um, Councillor Smith, your comments just now, how you implement a bus stop or so is very much a city council function. So you've got to go talk to them about how this business case is not that. Mm -hmm. And so I would love to see your support for this business case mm -hmm. and actually go and make submissions to city council to tell them off about what you want to tell them off. Yeah, but I know, I know. <laughs> but nicely. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So this is what... Um, let's deal with the how with our partners. And I've really enjoyed the conversations I've heard in the Future Proof Public Transport Committee. So good to see district and city council working well with us. Would love to support them to work together. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Marr, then I've got Councillor Nibon. Thank you, Councillor uh, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, my only comment is just, and, and obviously the Coromandel suffers from a lack of uh, public transport, but um, around the risks, and I've, I've identified, and it seems to be a reoccurring theme, that it's it's Waka Kotahi funding. Um, obviously, change of government. Have uh, I'm just curious, have we had any update um, just recently on, on where they're sort of sitting with funding? So we've all been waiting nationally for the um, reissue of the draft government policy statement for transport, which always is adjusted following an election. Yeah. Um, the indications were that we would be expecting that to come out to us in draft form somewhere between mid-January and uh, the end of February. The update we've had uh, following Christmas is that the latter end of that range is now looking more likely. So that, that if that comes out in draft towards the end of next month, still the 31st day, um, we, we will have an opportunity in March to respond to it. Um, and then they would issue a final document sometime in April or May. So it will it will continue to evolve as we go through the long term plan process and the regional land transport plan process. And we'll we'll have to adjust and uh, evolve uh, as we go. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ooh, as she takes she control of the mic. Um, are you. Um, um, just to give you some reassurance, though, the team that are developing this um, are uh, highly cognizant of what the, the current government's view is on some of these things. Um, for the city region, for the metro area, Good PT is a part of a good productive economy. So what we are doing is we've got Deloitte's on board looking at some work around how um, this type of uh, investment helps develop that really good mixed use land development, that really good city vibrancy and keeps that moving forward. So we know that we um, need to respond to the current government's kind of take on where they want their money to go. We're putting forward a strong case for this to continue um, through looking at those things that they're interested in with um, our partners. So we're future proofing it. Excellent. No, thanks. Acknowledging it is a good story. Thank you. And I, I suppose just building on that and recognizing that the next few uh, business cases we're discussing are around PT and we recognize that we don't have a GPS at this point. It would be useful for uh, counselors to be able to understand where the tensions might lie 
in these. You know, we can we can make decisions right now based on on our current GPS, but we need to also be cognizant of of what what might change and how that might imp, uh, impact on the decisions we're making today and where we're at as we move through this LTP. I guess I just want to make sure that we're flagging, and not necessarily today, because I, I, I assume that what you're presenting uh, to what, to us today is on your best knowledge mm -hmm. of what's coming, but we all recognize nothing is, is set in stone yet. So just yeah. wanting to make sure that as we work our way through these PT discussions, that, that, it, that we have that in the back of our mind. I, I think that's a very good point, and we will definitely ensure we keep council updated on that as we go. Maybe <clears> just the, the 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 point to make at this stage is that the government policy statement doesn't approve projects. It it allocates um, buckets of money within certain funding um, activities, and then it is the job of the Wakakotai Transport Agency to prioritise the national program and then allocate its resources to projects where there is local share in place. So this um, next six to nine months juggle that goes on every three years is, is exactly how that sifting of, of the of the mm. the total budget into those funding categories and then the funding categories into a program of works is is, is rolled out. So we'll we'll use um, PT subcommittee and the regional transport committee papers to 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 make sure that right. we're bringing both of those committees along with us. But if there's value in us sharing that with wider council here, then we can certainly do that. I think that there is value in sharing that with the water council because not everybody, well, not many of our councillors sit on RTC, no. and uh, and and only a selection of us sit on the Future Proof Public Transport Committee. And yet, this is a significant area of focus, let's say. Uh, so, just want to make sure we're keeping everybody um, uh, informed on where we're going. And how it might affect the decisions we're making both today and and over the next few months. Okay, Councillor Nebon. Well, no, just to say, really supportive of this, and and I've said it before. You know, um, I know Waipa District Council is very supportive. All the councillors there, and I mean Cambridge is up to nineteen over nineteen thousand people now. It's it's becoming a suburb of Hamilton, and I, I just don't think it's um, sustainable long term for the number of cars that travel between Cambridge and Hamilton every day, you know, to, to, to work. It's, it's just crazy at four o'clock in the afternoon down to Victoria Street. So re really supportive here. Great. So, so far I've heard support recognizing that we don't have a GPS. So that's where I'm, I'm, that's where I'm hearing. If there is an opposite view, I need to hear that. Can I ask a question? This is all about growth. And so you, Waikato, Waipa, and Hamilton are growth areas within the country. Will this lead? Yeah, like I, I'm yet to see the planning from Hamilton, and particularly the future proof area, that you know, like the bus lanes, the, the <laughs> it's the the roading infrastructure. Because you take people out of cars and put them in buses, but they are still held up in traffic. And there is very few places in Hamilton where buses can move efficiently and get ahead of traffic. And my concern is whilst the aspiration is to get people out of cars, with growth, only a percentage of the growth will move to buses. It's not an exponential growth into buses, and therefore the traffic will add to further congestion. So, so what you're advocating for so what uh, is the TA bus lanes. doing about the movement of public transport mm -hmm. to make it attractive for people mm -hmm. to move? That's probably really the challenge that I've got because in the past, when I sat on the public transport committee, I asked about corridors. The northeast wasn't there. Can we get a, can we get some commentary on on where bus lanes and provision for in yeah. our planning instruments or is? Or whatever. So, um, <laughs> whoa! Now you're just Straight being over. argumentative. I'm loving the enthusiasm. Corridor out there to the northeast, and, you know. So, um, so this uh, this particular business case forms the culmination of three years worth of work that went on that looked at where likely growth scenarios would sit across yeah. the future proof area that then got fed into the future proof 
strategy that's just come out. Um, Hamilton are, as we speak, working on a piece of work recommending bus rapid transit lanes in the city. Uh, so to support routes like the Comet, which are likely to carry on in the future. Um, one out to the east towards Rokura is being discussed. That's all in this diagram. So if you look on your diagram on page 502, the dark blue lines are the proposed BRT corridors and they would include full infrastructure. So we're talking bus lanes and very high quality transport interchange hubs with full security that are stations in their own right. So it's a step above where we are now. But the road to that is to increase your service frequencies, start pulling your networks into these rapid lines. That then creates the right story for the elected members of Hamilton to be able to say, look, the Comet's carrying all of these people. There's lots of um, demand for this service. Therefore, we can now start looking at spending money towards bus lanes and bus priorities because we're all in a chicken and egg where... We want these things to happen, but we also need to take the public with us on that journey. So the first step in that process is to get those frequencies up on those corridors, like we've done with the Meteor, like we're doing with the Comet, as we've got with the Orbiter. And then you can start to make the case for bus rapid transit lanes and more priority at those links. And that's what this business case is about. I appreciate it. With greatest respect, though, you know, 40, 50 years ago, Ross Jensen and his team in Hamilton City put aside Wairiri Drive, and it was just a green belt for 30-odd mm. years or more. And now, what a great asset to Hamilton City that is, except with the universities working and they block the traffic. Um, but the reality is, what, this model is back to front to what, you know, you've put aside the corridors to be able to achieve what you want, and now you're retrofitting. Yep. And that's why I find it hard to, to support things which are back to front. Well, this one in the south, we have a great opportunity um, as it currently stands. Um, Peacocks is not yet fully developed. So this business case also covers that southern area. And that's where we are starting to try and get those conversations going about that. Great. Yep. All of that is all being looked at as part of these business cases. That's exactly what we're doing. Great. All right. What do I, what do I? Just encouraging us to to move through this if we can. I've got Councillor Hughes, Councillor Downard, and Councillor Clifton. Councillor Hughes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'd like to support Councillor Smith's earlier comments on the on the um, damage that's being done to our roading infrastructure in Hamilton, particularly by two engineers. Yeah, but we're not debating today. That, the, those debating. the cause of this is two people um, being imposing their so and ideologies on the city, which is, and um, that's why they were okay, filed well, out. Let's of make sure we're debating the thing I before us. Do not support Tahuya unless the price for the fares is more reflective. Well, we haven't gotten to cost. Tahuya yet. Well, it's it's in the budget. It's the next. That's not the business case we're talking about right now, though. Correct. I'm ahead of myself. Sorry. I'll, yeah. I'll leave it there. But as far as I'm concerned, the transport system that we have at the moment is not fit for purpose, and, and everybody knows that by looking at the occupancy on the buses. We need to sit down, have a think tank, and come up with a much more user-friendly um, system, which is based on the Uber model. Um, no idea what the cost would be, but until we do that, I don't believe we're going to get support for public transport. That's where I'd like to see money going into developing a ground-up system. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Downard. So I think the report makes it quite clear that unless we have the relationship and the uh, the funding from central government, that it's unaffordable for ratepayers. But we have at the moment, what, whether what comes out in the GPS or not, in, in another month and a half. So, you know, a lot of these next business cases, are, you know, mainly focused on the next three years, uh, where we know we've got funding. Um, so yeah, I, I think you know public transport is a hard one, but we do we do need it in one form or another, and we are doing it backwards, um, Councillor Smith, because you know the infrastructure wasn't put there in the in the main place. You know Auckland's trying to address that with 
dedicated bus lanes, and I'm sure, you know, as cities grow, and, and especially in this uh, golden triangle, that, uh, you know, the priorities on the next business case, we've got the strategic focus that will be in that conversation with councils on, you know, future growth and, and, and those corridors that we need to make um, so people can adequately get to different places, um, you know, from one bus to another bus to another bus if they need to. All right, Councillor Cookson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, just my issue is just for transporters, because it's 51% funded by um, central government, that, that, that doesn't get a good enough lens or something over it to assess that it's doing its job and its capabilities properly. And um, until that's done at some stage, we're all going to, always going to be sitting around the table making the same argument. So, yeah, that's my opinion. All right. What I've heard is support for this business case, considering the impact, the potential impact of a, a change in government, central government direction. That's what I'm hearing. Despite the frustrations, I heard the frustrations too. I heard them too. But in terms of this business case, I'm hearing support. Okay. All right. Next one. So this is uh, the Tahuya Passenger Rail Service Enhancement, page 48 in the report, item 1410, page 599. Yes. So, Dave, if we could just go on. <laughs> this is the, this so is the Tahuya. Get, the, in um, Get in there early with your light. Get in there. Yeah. Oh, Dave, if we could just pop onto the, the slides there. So the, this business case um, is subject to a continuation of government funding at the current level um, and thinks through the recommendations that came from the Tahuya Governance Group in 2021 that resulted in an improvement plan being developed and maps out um, a pathway for us to enhance services at the end of the five-year trial. So this is subject to a whole series of, of approval stage gates being passed appropriately. But if in the context of, of a 10-year plan, uh, we felt it was prudent to include the provision for um, service enhancements to be uh, taken forward at the appropriate time within that within that 10-year period. Um, the, the, the business case there identifies a range of options that we've considered and, and we've gone for the intermediate option um, there, but you'll see that there are several identified beyond that point. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so this is this is providing provision outside of our this next three years, right? This is in year four, five, and six, Correct. and it is completely ta tagged to a, a sustainable level of funding from central government in support of. Correct. Okay. Just wanting to make sure our context is clear. Right. Uh, Councillor, wait a minute. Oh, Chris hasn't even put his light on. I was shocked. Councillor Cookson. Oh, you left yours on. Uh, Councillor Graff. Thanks. Does um, Auckland Council contribute to the to who yeah? No, um, and we've asked them, um, and I, sus I recommend that we submit to their long-term plan requesting that formally. Um, but at this stage, mm. we are funding 25% or the local share component is 25% of the non-fair total costs and the balance is made up by government at 75%. There was a recent, recent um, outcome, was it? The Auckland Council pulling out? Well, they never they've, did. They've, they've never supported. Well, we didn't. We didn't used to. We couldn't um, access interregional contributions, could we? So, so Auckland. There was a recent um, at the time to who um, was launched. Auckland um, were not part of the the funding package and have never been part of the funding package. Um, so it's more of a one way benefit, like. Hamilton to Auckland. Auckland's not interested in coming back. Well, the, the, um, the 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 organisation and the leadership shown within the Waikato region, supported within the Future Proof sub-region, um, proceeded with a train um, 
that was um, focused on getting people from the Waikato into Auckland. Mm. There are clearly benefits to both regions, and that's the pitch for a shared funding model, which is the same as as is seen with the Capital Connection Service. Um, but there is an there is an appetite from here to to reapproach Auckland, mm. Mm. but that's looking slim. Oh, I, change of government. You know, it, it, I I couldn't predict what um, Auckland Council is going to decide. Uh, yeah, but so, the but the participant in the um, future proof. Uh, committee and the Future Proof Public Transport Committee that is from Auckland Central, or so, uh, sorry, Auckland Council has been supportive. Mm, yes. And and 10% um, 10 um, fair revenue, is that, is that, what capacity is that? So we're currently um, reporting um, 13 to 14 percent is our is our fair revenue, um, and the two-year review document that we're just pulling together at the moment um, con confirms that that has been the case through both of the financial years of the two-year trial. Is is in okay? If it was operating at a high level, if it was the capacity was full, what would it return? Would it be self-funding? Public transport nationally is not self-funding. No. The, the target for fair revenue for Tahuia is about 15%. So we are we are roughly in, in line with that. Uh, there was a decision made at the time of launch that the service would um, function and be charged on the basis of the zone structure that we have in place for all public transport across the region. And that has set the fare at the level it has. Um, so we've we've roughly broadly have achieved the target for fair revenue based on uh, all of those factors. So patronage is at the level that it needs to be in order to achieve the target that we have we have set. And the and the and the maximum patronage one way um, over two hundred around two hundred per per train. And just one last thing: the, all buses, extra buses dedicated to the same service as opposed to a train. Is, what can you tell me what the benefit of the train is over the buses? Um, there are several. Uh, one is that people can uh, walk around, they can they can engage with other people more easily, they can they can work um, comfortably, they can be productive. Um, in terms of journey time, uh, we in in the in the report that we're working on now are showing that fairly frequently it is quicker to catch the train than drive now. And over time, as the Auckland network gets more congested, the train, even if there are no changes to travel time, will get quicker, more quick, but quick relative to the car will become a faster trip. Um, in addition, the train in, in terms of the data is hugely more reliable in terms of a travel time that's the same every time than, than a, a car journey where there's enormous fl uh, fluctuation in travel time. And when and sorry, just leading on to just mm -hmm. so let's say people are interested in the train in three years' time, capacity is two hundred. Then we decide we rush to the station and want to catch the train and it's full. Is is so? Is it always just going to be a for two hundred, or is there going to be more carriages? I can. So these uh, the the improvement plan in twenty twenty one identified a package of. Um, enhancements that were at the time recommended to proceed proactively. So the aim at the time was that you put on a service and people will come. The change in, in pushing out these enhancements for three years is intended to ensure that we are providing services at the time that they are needed. So our, our growth, our modelling is, is suggesting that in, in that time period, these additional services will be ready and people will use them rapidly and, and that they will start to fill up. There will always be a, a capacity constraint because we currently only have 12 carriages. Um, but using them more and getting the best out of what we have is the best way to provide seats in one direction or the other as much as we can. If we buy, I mean, the, the, the next business case is about running stock. Though, as well, and if, so there's only a limit to the tracks that they can run on. So, yeah, anyway, thanks. Thanks for that, Phil. 
Well, this uh, originally was about uh, people from the Waikato making their way into Auckland. Do we have any statistics of how many people, how many passengers are originating in Auckland and traveling south? We we know um, that it has increased. Um, the the day commute is not possible from the north um, because with of the these service enhancements, it. would that facilitate that? It definitely it does, and particularly. Um, for example, on a Saturday, there's now a choice to come south for a short period of time that isn't there at the moment. Um, the the uh, three weeks that ran in early August when the um, the lift uh, of of our, our prohibition to get into Auckland was was uh, was put in place, we did see large numbers of people coming south, um, and there were reports of groups arriving at Frankton Station and, and being directed for a walk around the lake or a range of things that, that we hadn't seen before. So we, we know that there is interest from the north. At the moment, it, it isn't an easy journey. Um, but it, it, we, we, we absolutely, the, the original modelling even, um, but, but certainly anecdotally, we see that there is potential for a lot of interest from the north. All right, I've got Councillor Dunbar-Smith, Councillor Strange and Councillor Nicholl. Ben. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jude. Um, so it looks like we're waiting on two things here. One is the government policy statement sometime late February. Um, and the second thing is obviously if we go forward with this public consultation on the LTP, so the public will be asked to give their views. You've stated quite categorically here that uh, if the financial assistance rate of 51% local ratepayers 49, this would be unaffordable to ratepayers. So you're pretty adamant about that from a staff perspective. Well, that would be your decision, but my my thought would be that that is a, a significant increase in in um, local share costs, right. and it would impose a greater burden on on the ratepayers region wide. Uh, Phil, it's my understanding is that difference is about one and a half million dollars at today's dollars. Yeah. So I guess it's, it's a one and a half million dollar difference, and who would pay for that at the moment? That would be the current uh, um, targeted rate payer, um, but that's the quantum that we're talking about. Well, I just like it stated in whatever we go out to the public on that it, it's unaffordable unless it's seventy five percent, because it's quite possible the government policy statement will come back in late February and go fifty percent. I mean. And then we're left with a decision on that. Um, I'd just like it clear to the public that um, our staff view is that 75% is the minimum amount that could be contributed by government. Any comments on that? Nothing no. specific, but it's, it's as stated in the report. Uh, Councillor Strange. Ben, can I get you to turn your mic on? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just to a few of Clyde's points before about um, fare box recovery. Um, further along in the agenda, we are looking at fares potentially being increased as well, which would um, go some ways towards um, increasing that percentage as well moving forward. Um, the other thing that we do need to keep in mind with Tahuia is that we don't just run a train for the sake of running a train. It's to, you know, unlock housing along that corridor as well. And especially in North Waikato, you know, they're crying out <laughs> for another station there. And um, the district has plans, you know, they've had indicative business cases looking at stations up there, um, which would just unlock so much potential for people coming along, say Highway 2 from Thames or Hauraki, um, Bay of Plenty to also access to Huia to get into Auckland as well. Um, we know that people who do use interregional rail, um, you know, are our younger people who can't drive, or our older people who choose who can't drive or choose not to drive in Auckland as well. Um, so it's it is about commuters, but um, the data shows that the people who are using the train, it's more than just going up for work. It it's for study, it's for relationships, it's for family, it's, you know, it's a safe way for kids to get back to school if they're boarding in Auckland and vice versa. Um, we know also that long term, last long term plan when we consulted um, over 95% of people 
agreed with where we were heading with Tahuia and wanted us to go faster um, on the improvements which we which we have done and the results um, speak for themselves in patronage and more choice um, from next week. Um, we're offering extra services as well that um, give people the option to have a half day meeting in Auckland as well. Fonterra was a huge um, submitter to the initial working group um, and contributor to saying, yep, we'd love for our staff to use Tahuia to access our head offices in Auckland. However, the day's too long. Um, so yeah, we've we've come through with all the feedback we've had from community around what could make it go better. And we've been really nimble with that. And I'm really proud of what we have done in that space. So as it says in, up there in red, 75% um, government funding is needed to keep this going. Um, so it is um, affordable for our ratepayers. But um, the benefits are, are wider than just transport. And we just need to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nicol. Make this real simple for everyone, and that's the fact that there'll be 14 people sitting around this table debating these numbers again in three years' time. Yeah. So all we're here to do now is to send an indication of if it's going to keep going, that it needs improvement, which is true. You're never going to keep it at the level it is now. You're either going to kill it, and if that happens, I'd say that's coming from central government because they can put that out in their GPS or they can not fund going forward or they can choose not to expand it if it's always going to stay the way it is right now it's not even really worth having um however it's a journey it's a startup service as was drilled into us by the last council um Huberka in particular who was very passionate about this um and it had good support with the last council i would say just let this be and see what happens, let the next council have a really good go at it with a lot more information. Um, the regional council did put the idea up. I do think it was a flaw of that business case not to work with Auckland then, but, you know, these things evolve. And I do hope we submit to them and say, look, this is something that um, if central government will continue to invest in, you really should be part of. Um, so we put it up, central government wanted it, central government funded it, central government's still funding it. Um, it hinges on them, very much so. So um, either central government will decide to pull back and say, no, nah, don't need rail in New Zealand, that kind of thing, in this kind of capacity. Um, or they'll hopefully come up with a vision to go to Tauranga, to go to Wellington, to you know allow things to go across the Cook Strait even. And New Zealand will be a country that has some rail capacity in, in this kind of way. Um, but if it dies, let them kill it. Uh, for now, just wait and see. Let everyone have a chat in three years' time about it. I think we just need the signal that if it's going to stay, it needs to improve. And so I'm quite happy with the year four, five, six numbers for now. Thanks. Mm. Uh, Councillor Graff, did you have further... Okay, sorry, can I? Oh, I'm just noting I've got a green. Um, thanks. Just can you explain just simply government pulls out 50 office 50% or something or other? Can you just tell us does that mean when they liquidate the, the, the infrastructure, the um, assets now? Or what happens? Is it put on the back burner for another three years? How does it work? We park up the train somewhere in Frampton yeah. and mm. well, the, yeah, the um, the the, <laughs> the investment in stations, rolling stock, maintenance facilities um, effectively um, becomes stranded at that point. So the uh, the stations would close. Um, the the maintenance facility would be where the, probably the units would be parked up, um, subject to somebody wanting to have a go at it again in the future. Um, the, the way the funding worked in the first place, um, anything on the ground or below the ground was funded at 100% by government. And then things above the ground, so platforms and railway stations were funded uh, a, a combination of local share from the relevant district council um, and, and Waka Kotahi. So 
those investments are, are, are what they are and they, they, the ownership of them kind of remains in those hands. So Hamilton City would continue to own things and what kind of district would continue to own things. Uh, Councillor Marr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just, just a couple of things, Phil. Um, I, regardless of the government funding, I, I just, I just struggle that um, the, the long-term infrastructure and view is just not there for, for this passenger service to survive. Um, but just, to, just going back to one of your earlier comments, um, you, you see that with Auckland congestion and stuff like that, the journey times and stuff um, should it, should improve and actually be quicker than taking your car. Except in the status quo, we've got um, improved journey times won't, won't be met. Improved reliability won't be met. So just a comment around that, because it's just looking at um, if this stays the same for the next two and a half years of its trial, et cetera, that nothing's going to improve. So in the short term, um, we are seeing trains running quicker than the car. In the context of the city rail link and all of the engineering works that are happening across Auckland right now with uh, the electrification of Papakura to Pukekohe, the building of new stations in Drury, as well as all of the rail network rebuild project, which is shutting sections of the Auckland network down. We're seeing real challenges getting into Auckland consistently, but, but the aspiration is that that will improve over time. So the short term situation is that effectively we're working through all of that. In three years time, um, those works will all be finished. The city rail link will be open and Auckland will start operating to a new timetable. Um, and we have slots protected in that timetable at this point for us to be able to, to, to get through with a much more uh, reliable service as we go. And I it, do see 99% of services were delivered. My other question is, in that meeting with Auckland councillors, I know there were some questions around the figures that were supplied to them compared to the figures that you were quoting. Has that been cleared up? So the, the they have current figures. The two year review is going through all of that information and we, we're pulling together figures that reflect the, uh, the the sets of parameters that we're working to. So the answer is no, they have no more updated. We haven't updated at this stage. We haven't updated them. Um, a lot of the numbers they were quoting uh, included the capital contribution at the beginning, which um, changes the the way it's not the way public transport is funded um, uh, nationally. So to, to talk about um, uh, revenues against the total capital sum as opposed to just an operating sum meant that their numbers were coming out a lot lower. And the the, the information that was being requested in the um, OIAs and the Lagoimas that we respond to was about ticket revenue as opposed to total fare revenue. So So there were a whole bunch of differences between what they were using as the basis for what they were saying and the, the whole of the funding story for public transport. Uh, just in my my eyes, I see them a critical partner into the viability of this future of the service. Yeah. Thank you. And really looking forward to the outcome of the two year review, because I think that that gives us avenue to have further discussions. So. All right. I have Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, question. Does any other interregional service receive a 75% subsidy? That's the first question. No. But the. And so if it's no, why is it realistic to expect the government, and particularly this government, to continue a 75% subsidy? So the, the but is that the other interregional rail service that operates is co-funded by Wellington and Horizons, who both put in 25%. Yeah, yeah. So effectively, the government's contribution is increased to keep the local share contribution at the level that we're currently paying. Yeah, so, <coughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that because I think that's is obvious. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nibon. Oh, it's just to say that, um, look, obviously there's a bit of stuff here we, we don't know the outcome of yet, but I'm mm. supportive of where we're heading at the moment. And I think Jen summed it up pretty well here. Thank you. Mm. Uh, like that nice, <laughs> clear <laughs> indicator of where people are sitting. Otherwise, I'm having to interpret. Mm. And I'm not sure you all want me to do that. Uh, Councillor Hodge. 
So I'm supportive to the subject to continuation of government funding. But I also want to make it pretty clear that, that my constituencies do not use the tuhuya because I am on everywhere else except Hamilton City and Auckland. So I, I worry about that from my perspective on whether or not it suits my constituency to tick a box if it goes outside the subject to continuation of government funding. So we'll wait and see how that goes. And if the government funding doesn't happen and then you come back to the table to look at the bigger fund, then, then I might have some descriptions here around where we sit. Goodbye. All right. Are we, just testing, are we collectively supportive of this uh, contingent, very clearly contingent, on the government funding? So I saw a shake of a head, Councillor Mars. So are you saying that if if the government continued to support it at the 70, 75%, you're still not supportive of this? I'm still undecided, to be quite honest. I, I, I don't think, um, waiting to see where they, the fair reviews and that sort of thing get to, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a good enough return there on that side of it, regardless of the 75%. As, as, as a service, I, I'm struggling mm -hmm. with that part of it. All right. Good. Okay. Moving on to the next. Sorry, did you have? Um, we we haven't decided anything because we aren't deciding anything. We're just sort of working our way through. But uh, there was. Uh, I was asking the uh, council if there was support of this clearly contingent on that seventy five percent funding from government. And uh, some nodded, and there was a, a clarification that even at 75% for some, they don't see the point of this. So uh, which side would you like to land on that? I think the decision's already made, but it hasn't been announced. Okay, that wasn't the question <laughs> I asked. <laughs> So, <laughs> Councillor Smith, neutral. Just through, just through, Madam Chair. So, and, and just so everybody's clear, that if you <laughs> if you didn't support that, that means. You want to perhaps continue the services beyond year three as they currently are with no enhancement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm just, they, they haven't given a status quo as an option, have they? This is the, this is the enhancement. So the business case identifies five options. Status quo is, is option one, BAU, uh, and that's in there. Our recommendation, as I said at the beginning, was intermediate, which is to enhance services from year three. We're only talking about signalling in three years, uh, four years time, increasing them. Yeah. So that none of the money, if you support this, there won't be any money spent additional in the next three years. It will start year four on. Which so means, which means a whole nother debate, a whole nother council, another council so and a whole nother LTP. To any, just, just, just signalling to our communities is what we're doing. I think we need to ask the question is what level does the community see as reasonable to support train? Because if we are saying through the trial that 15% is acceptable in the community at large through whatever other mechanism and somebody's going to pay that 25% and it's not the government. So if the community is paying that 25% cost, is 18%, uh, 15, 18% air box recovery reasonable? I think that's, you know, what is it, what level are we prepared to sustain as a community to support this service? If we accept this business case, the level is 51%. No. Not 50, no, sorry, no. Is, is 75. 
as well, our contribution is the is the yes, remaining yeah, yeah, yeah twenty five. Twenty five. That's what I, right. what I was saying about. Is that yeah we've got a are they prepared to sustain the twenty five percent going forward, or will they support going to fifty? Yeah. Can but I that, tell that, them? That's not that's not what's no. No, no. this is only if we have the seventy five percent. And can yeah. I so and and if we reflect on the outcome of last LTP, where as Councillor Strange highlighted, ninety five percent of submitters were saying they increase. were wanting yeah, an increase. But the but this the is going to provide three years from but the reality now. madam chair is if you put another train on for 200 people and they don't come the, the fare box recovery drops well there's all sorts of things that you know, people may so or may not it, do it, yeah okay all right we're going to i really want to move on well, just want to clarify so um we uh Going to make a decision on this today. It will go out for public submission. If a decision not is, today, but yeah. no, but but it will go during out this ready, meeting, yeah, this ready, ongoing yeah, meeting, it will go out ready for um, June, July. Um, if a decision is made by government through the GPS at the end of February or March, will we have a rediscussion, or is it then continue on as a LTP process out for public consultation? And that was that was what I was asking earlier in this discussion is is how do we as a council stay on top of uh, how government central government decisions may impact on how we go forward with this? Uh, Madam Chair, we could just flip to Janine just about the LTP process about how this would work. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Executive. Through the chair. Um, again, probably coming back to what's in our consultation and what's not. This was not something that we were anticipating that we were going and consulting with the community on. We have already done that in terms of a commitment to a trial. Um, so I'm not sure what we would be reconsulting on and given that this is um, investment beyond those first three years. What I've been talking to Wendy about is in terms of um, in the context for context setting for the consultation document where we're talking about resilience and the broad, really broad framing of that, um, is there something that we can include that um, particularly talks to our transport investment inclusive of Tahuia, but highlights those um, key assumptions that we're making around um, Waka Kotahi funding and the potential consequence of if that funding is not successful. So we're not consulting on it, but we're highlighting it in, in terms of how we're giving effect to resilience, but the key assumptions that we're making um, in doing so. In terms of when we have clarity around um, government funding, uh, I think as we've talked about, uh, the document the position of council needs to be landed this week in terms of what will form the basis of consultation. While the document is out for consultation alongside receiving staff sub, uh, community submissions, staff are also able to make a submission through the chief executive that will put on the table new information that we've received that needs to influence the final budget position that you will consider in June. So in terms of certainty around this funding, we would deal with it um, through that submission process so it can come into your deliberations before we actually adopt the annual the LTP proper. Does that provide us some level of comfort Just that will be clear in our communication with the with the community? Just to clarify, so the uh, the, the process of the trial will continue subject to the government funding being 75%. And so we don't need to consult again on that, but there will be a new consultation in the next LTP to find out if people want the service to continue ad infinitum. But there will be a there will be an opportunity for the public to have a decision about whether the long-term service continues. Mm -hmm. But they could okay. start it up again. I'm, I'm just wanting to know the process that's on. Uh, yeah, through just, you, through uh, you, Chair. I guess we can't determine what uh, what um, 
uh, council may determine in three years time um, in terms of what may be consulted on at that point in time. But obviously there is a clear review point for everybody um, and at the end of the trial, which is so, so, 2026. So there is, and um, the other part of that is that the end of the five years occurs at that time as well. So, in the in the, in the same way that when we trial bus services and then progressively try to move them into what's called the continuous program, we would look to do the same for rail at that point. So there's there is a process we would go through, and that would need you know, discussions with the agency and, and a successful five year review process. So. Within the council, we'll definitely be talking about this in three years' time. Whether whether it's it's a topic of, of direct consultation in the LTP or not. So just quickly, that seventy five percent decision from government. When again is that due? As I said, the government policy okay. statement. Yeah. Okay, so it's due this soon. If we biff this out now, do you think that would have an impact on government's decision to say, "Oh well, there's not much interest in why I don't." We won't. We'd certainly be taking off the table um, a, a, um, a strong statement that we see the service could in, be enhanced over time, but, but the status quo service sits there underneath all of that too. So it, we'd reduce that strong signal. But you're absolutely right, but um, how much is is, a, is another question. All right. Okay. I want to move on to the next business case. Because I think a lot of that conversation was actually very pertinent to the next business case as well. Because again, we're talking about things in the future that are contingent on, on verification of central government direction. So we're moving on to the next one, which is the um, uh, rolling stock. This is the rolling stock. This is on page 49 and also 619, 1411. Is the rolling so I I'm I'm keen to get the last PT in as well before lunch. So if we can just you know we've had a lot of discussion around the government commitment. So let's reflect on what we've already discussed when we're we're addressing this one, and then hopefully we can power for the power power through the next two. Go. Oh, thank you. Um, so David, we can pop through to the to the rolling stock slides. Um, thank you for the the conversation we had on this at the workshops in December. Um, we've updated the business case um, to reflect, um, and in the in the LTP budgets reflect what Wellington are identifying as a potential 10% deposit requirement sometime in year three of the of the LTP, um, and that would be the point where a, an order would be secured if we were to proceed with one. Um, the other change. Or the the, um, the the statement there in red applies. The difference here is that Wellington achieved a 90% crown contribution towards their NIRIM um, project, which includes trains and tracks. Um, that was comprised of 51% from Waka Kotahi and a further 39% from a budget uh, announcement allocation in the central from, from other crown funds. My recommendation here is that we would look to proceed on the same basis. So that would require both an, a Waka Kotahi funding discussion, but also a Crown budget conversation. Um, so, so that's that's the update. In terms of, um, I mentioned in December that there is some technical work going on, and it's bullet two there um, under uh, underway in the background, and that I would share with you some of what that technical work is saying when we get together here. So the business case you have in front of you, um, you know, identifies several options, but the, the detailed business case behind this has identified 55 potential alternative options. From that, it has identified a long list of 15. And from that, the, the detailed business case work um, has proceeded to assess a short list of five options, which includes the BAU, but also um, replacing the stock with secondhand carriages elsewhere from the globe, um, con continuing with the NIRIM process or independently purchasing either electric multiple units, buying our own equivalent of the NIRIM order um, or buying diesel uh, or battery loco hauled um, locos and then some rolling stock. So those those options are um, 
undergoing um, a technical assessment in the background here beyond the long term plan business case that, that you can see in front of you. And, we're, and, and uh, that that process is 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 uh, underway now with economic case and commercial case work. Happy to answer any questions. Great. So this has the requires the seventy five percent from government alongside the ninety percent crown uh, crown share for the purchase. Both of those conditions. Both of those conditions we have to be met. We need a train to be running, and and our recommendation is that that if we were to purchase new stock, we should get the same conditions as has been seen on the lower North Island. And if we didn't, then it wouldn't happen. Well, it would be your call as to whether you were prepared to pay more. Yeah. All right. Okay. On that, uh, did uh, uh, what else? Councillor Smith. I do not support council owning. Um, structure such as rail stock, not our core business. End of story. It was very clear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Councillor Graff. Thank you. Uh, you've probably mentioned it a hundred times, but sometimes the brain's not working so well. But um, so. Uh, the WRC contribution to to Huia, What's the what's the um how what's the rating model? How does that work? Who's contributing? Sorry. Is it targeted? It was general. How's it funded? Uh, if I can maybe just help kick it off, and someone can correct me where I've got it wrong. It's I understand it's uh, targeted around Hamilton and some. There's some to the north. Uh, in the Waikato district who contribute as well. Right. Okay. So, so Coromandel, Topo, Waipa are not contributing to this rail service. Unless they write it and pay a fare. Unless you write it. Mm. Okay. And no, I just wanted to be, I just wanted to know. Thank you for asking that question. I mm. think that's really helpful um, clarity for everyone. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Marr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Phil, confidence in the, in the figure you've got down here still being the price of uh, rolling stock in the year 2026? Uh, based on what we're hearing from Wellington, uh, yes. Sorry, how is Welling is Wellington building it? So the preferred option is, is to proceed by tacking on an order for Tahuya rolling stock on the end of the lower North Island order and they would do the procurement work and, and we would get prices that mirror their prices. So they, there's not a fixed contract out there at the moment. They secure government funding in um, mid 2023 and are, are out with the market with an expression of interest process at the moment that will turn into a request for proposal process in um, somewhere around April, March, May this year. So you should see fixed costs around that period. Okay. Um, why isn't Kiwi Rail investing in rolling stock? They could, and nationally they could have that conversation about owning it themselves. Um, There's a 50 year lifespan, I would have thought. Yep. And they own the Northern Explorer stock and the, the, the South Island stock. Yes. Cool. Um, and I just echo Noel's um, comments too. I don't believe that WRC should, should um, own rolling stock. Thanks. If I could just add to that, um, so I understand Wellington do own their kit and they are going to, to market to get some of the 90% contribution from government and effectively they're saying to others, well, if you want to jump in, this is the time to do it because it, you'll never get a better price because you'll be buying lesser kit, if you like. That's that's why it's come, that's the only reason it's coming to a fore now. Uh, to try and leverage off that opportunity. Uh, Councillor Cookson. I just oh, sorry, sorry, mm. sorry. Mm. Councillor Strange and Councillor Cookson. Councillor Strange. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, just on the ownership of the rolling stock. Um, who owns the current rolling stock? What was the question? Oh, yeah. 
nominally, I think uh, we do with an offer back to Waka Kotahi randomly. Right, thank you. Um, and yeah, just want to echo what um, our chief executive said about the economies of scale that can be achieved if we do go with the Wellington bid. And I did have one further point, but I forget what it is, so if I could come back. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cookson. Thank you, Manager Chair. Yeah, the um, idea of um, clipping into Wellington, there's normally a great word called, um, um, what is it, the a differential of contract, and it's never cheaper. It's always more expensive. So um, I don't think you're going to get them cheaper by adding them onto them. Well, that's one opinion of mine anyway. Um, and well, I'm the same. That that's what's being proposed here. Yeah, that, yeah, but that's what's been, it is. You're altering onto a, and then the, uh, the, you're altering the contract and there'll be a cost to it. I don't. Oh, that's, that's, not that's my how this business organizes. I understand what you're talking about in that situation, but I just want to clarify that's not what we're talking about so here. Wellington um, have already included uh, within their documents to the market that there may be interest from other parts of New Zealand. When they get to the RFP process and subject to your conversations here today, they would say that there's um, a stronger level of interest from elsewhere in New Zealand. But effectively, they'd be looking to get guaranteed uh, cost and a faster delivery than us going out and tendering globally for ourselves for four or five sets, as opposed to a much larger order, which which they are um, managing and, and are procuring right now. OK, so just it's not the, my understanding. It's not the same thing that you're referring to. But go ahead. I think it does. But anyway, um, anyway, I don't support it. So I'm same as Noel and um, Warren. Thank you. Uh, mm, thanks. Just um, ten year debt, WRC for this project. Is that right? Is that it's at eleven eleven point six five million? Is that what I'm? So that would be a ten percent share. Yeah, and and ten percent. Um, the the it would based on the what's in the long term plan would be funded by debt, which would be repaid, I think, over and incorrect me, I believe fifty years. So debt, yep, debt. So does is debt when you've had when you collect rates, targeted rates that are distributed to the area that they benefit, right? But when when it's debt, how's the debt repaid? Is it what's used to repay debt? Is it still the targeted contribution? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Nickel. OK, thanks. Um, I'm in support of this um, proposal at present, knowing that it will be redebated over and over. At this point in time, there are numbers on a page. We're not actually collecting this money in the near future. There's so much new information between now and when this is an actual decision of um, follow through. This is a paper that's about sending a signal um, and, and showing what we think that this is what is possible, I suppose. I think that central government, well, when I think about how this process started, it started with a champion who said rail between Auckland and Hamilton, right? And I think we're in a weird space right now where we don't have a lot of central government direction. And I'm not even sure they know what they want to do with rail. Uh, maybe they do, but they haven't told any of us yet. So here we are. Um, but I think it comes back to that old thing where you're either not going to have rail in New Zealand and you should just stop wasting time and money on it, <laughs> or you are going to have rail and make a vision and actually do something. So. I wonder who that champion's going to be about sorting out this mess that it's in based on the fact that the rail system, especially for passenger rail in New Zealand, has been gutted over decades and decades and decades. My question is, and it's probably for Phil or Chris, do we have capacity to lead a conversation with the regional sector about what this could look like? Or um, who owns rolling stock if there are multiple regional councils that provide rail in their region and be between regions. 
um, because I, I personally am not a fan of us owning carriages. Um, I unless somebody brings me a memo and says that it's actually a great investment, I'm leaning towards no. I'm thinking Kiwi Rail is fantastic to own these, and I think someone should have a conversation with Kiwi Rail. So we we are having that conversation in, at the regional sector, and I I cool. do sit on that particular portfolio. So. Fantastic. So if that's happening and there is the potential to give central government a bit of a hand from bottom up to say, this is how it could work, because they're very busy people, and they might not come up with the best ideas themselves since they're not doing it day to day. So if we're doing that, then I'm just happy to support this for now so that we're sending a signal of what's possible, and again, it comes back to them. Thank you. Councillor Nebun. Yeah, look, pretty similar page to what Jen is, and it kind of feels to me like we might not have any real certainty as to the future of this sort of passenger rail in New Zealand until we've seen a few successions of government in the next decade, you know, and I think once that settles down, we, we might. That's just kind of how it feels to me. I don't know what other ownership models um, they have in Europe and that sort of thing for rolling stock, but it, it seems to me that a decade or so down the track and there's a bit more um, certainty that there could be the same sort of option as what as what we have with buses in terms of contractors. I, I have, I'm just guessing a crystal ball casing and I'm obviously not close to this kind of so I don't really know, but but yeah, look, I'm supporting where we're going at the moment. We've, we've got to keep doing this until such time as we get told to. The, the um, purchase that Wellington is looking at, so that's in conjunction with Horizon, right? Horizon. So they're buying. Well, they're going to. Yeah. It's it's that capital connection, it, it right? Does that the operates capital. and is co-funded between Greater Wellington and Horizons. And as I understand it, they're talking about with this new rolling stock, they're looking to increase to what five, five um, trips a day, as opposed to the one that they're doing or something. It was it was considerable increase. So what, in frequency. Yeah. So what this what this purchase will give to the Lower North Island is a consistent rail platform, a uh, uh, um, rail carriage platform that would operate um, both on electrified and non-electrified networks all the way up the company you, coast, Palmerston North, as well as Wairarapa and, my, and my, Wellington Metro. So yes, it, it it gives them far more capacity to run a greater set of services. My point, though, is that that's the level of support they see from their communities. Yes. Having had an interregional rail in existence, they're seeing that that level of of support from their communities. They are. They've had twenty and twenty or so and years. And the of, one on the the community on the other end of our line is, of course, the biggest community in New Zealand. So just just putting that out there. Oh, some do. I get messages. I get messages from from people in in Auckland about how fantastic the Tahuya is. But y'all know what I think. All right. Um, I've got Councillor Marr and uh, Councillor Dunbar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just on an earlier point, can I just come to Janine for clarity that we don't have a 50 year old train and carriages on our books? Correct. Thank you. All right. So we don't own this rolling, the current rolling stock. The proposed rolling stock we will own. Is that, I just want some clarity on that. Yes. Yes, okay. All right, where are we? Councilor Dunbar. Um, my concern with this proposal is that we're being, it appears, required to confirm a decision on purchase for $110 million worth of rolling stock by the middle of 2024. I mean, surely that with 90% with funding, but we're still, we're, we're, we're signing up for something six months from now or less. Um, when, I mean, is that correct? So this, this process has evolved as the business case work has been underway and, and we've received letters and more detail from Wellington um, and, and as well as the detailed business case work that we've been undertaking. The way the way things are currently laid out, as far as I understand them, is that um, 
the RFP process will identify an interest elsewhere in New Zealand and will seek a cost for those units if they were to be added to the Lower North Island contract. We would be asked to confirm our order uh, at a point in the manufacturing process um, and with that confirmation would be required to pay a 10% deposit. Um, and my uh, information suggests that that would occur sometime in 2026. So we've included the requirement for that 10% dollar based on the uh, estimated procurement costs based on the numbers from Wellington in, in year three of the LTP. Um, if we chose to pay those dollars, then our contribution would be the local share of the remaining sum in 2029 or 2030 at the point that the, the carriages are delivered. So we we have, uh, within the LTP, we've identified um, a potential to continue, um, but you haven't um, decided, you haven't committed beyond um, uh, the LTP level to pay that money. It would be an annual plan decision, I suppose, at the right time, if all of these conditions were met for you to decide to carry on. But in the LTP, you're identifying that you're committing to that process um, subject to all of these. Subject to all of those conditions. Yes. The alternative would be to refurbish uh, carriages from Tamanui. Um, that seems to be another option that's sitting there. So the detailed business case considered that and um, continuing to use existing carriages Firstly, um, they are at end of life from a, uh, a, a, a construction perspective in that they are non-frangible. Uh, they're, they're solid blocks of metal that, that aren't as good in a crash as, as, as more modern stock. They don't have crumple zones. They don't have the safety protection for passengers that modern stock would. If, if we were to in, increase our fleet by buying more of, these, of the same, we end up with the same issues around um, getting into Auckland, um, still having older stock, effectively continuing to renovate stock that is at the end of its life. So that's that's like the BAU option and then BAU plus plus, which is just adding more of the same, have both been ruled out within the detailed business casework. But with that, you wouldn't have to make a commitment by the end of the end of this, the middle of this year to sign on to the Greater Wellington process. Um, no. But they're potentially from a point in the future, we wouldn't be able to get into Auckland anymore. Or, or we'd have stock that, that is costing us millions of dollars to renovate, to keep on the, on the tracks, so to speak. So the, the BAU option is, is ruled out within the detailed business case. So why would you not be able to get into Auckland anymore with our existing carriages? Well, we, we have uh, identified a need to invest in electronic train control protection um, around the time that the city rail link opens. Um, those could be transferred to any any equipment that we purchase. But within Auckland, they have a metro system that has a, a consistent fleet with consistent acceleration, deceleration times. They, they are running a, from the opening of the city rail link, they're running a, a timetable that has far finer margins between on time and late. Um, and um, we we are become the anomaly in that network for them. Um, so the desire for us to be operating on a similar level of stock that has the same performance characteristics and the same lengths and the same platform heights and the same everything else as as other equipment that's running in Auckland is is a, is a reason that Auckland would be reluctant to see us continue into the long 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 term. And so we'd have to buy trains as well then. Uh, sorry, Phil, I, I think the point is it's getting away from diesel locomotives, isn't it? That well, then, then there's all in, of the other parts. can't go too. into a city rail link. And so these are hybrid technologies so that they 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 they, they can. And, and each unit's self-propelled, isn't it? It's not That's just a requiring yes. a locomotive to pull it around, which right. Kiwi Rail have none of. Okay. That's another whole part to it as well, yes. All right. Okay. I'm going to end that discussion. Oh, sorry. That's okay. okay. I'm going to make it real quick. Get in. I support it, given all of the writers that are in the in the slide in front of us, and the same was for the previous one. Yeah. It's about pre preserving options for now until we find out. Right. 
and um, and I am sure that it's clear with councillors that I am supportive of this for the very reasons you um, refer to, uh, Councillor Clarkson. Also, that support is based on a number of conversations I have had within the constituency that I represent and the and the district council within that constituency that does support continued uh, investment and development of interregional passenger rail to the point where they are looking at additional stations. So just so we're all clear. All right, I had hoped that we could close off all of the PT prior to lunch, but it is now three minutes past one and I think everybody needs a break. So we are going to break for lunch. Uh, we'll adjourn the meeting, it's 104. Uh, we'll uh, come back together at 1.30. Thank you.